Hare Krishna and Namaste to all of our guests this evening. Thank you very much for joining us for another session of Tools for Human Empowerment. Uh, this is the Vedic Friends Association. My name is Balabhadra Bhattacharya Das. I am currently the president of Vedic Friends, but tonight we're very, very excited, very fortunate to have the founding president of Vedic Friends, who's going to do a wonderful presentation tonight. And uh, we're excited about that. It's going to be based on the Bhagavad Gita, but in such a way that people can begin to understand it even more readily. So I'm going to pass it over to our secretary for VFA, Anjali, and she's going to introduce our speaker for tonight. Thank you, Prabhuji. Stephen Knapp, or Sri Nandanandana Dasa, has been studying the major Vedic texts of India and practicing yoga and Eastern teachings since 1971. He was initiated by his divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada in 1976. He has traveled throughout India extensively and has a collection of over 18,000 slides and images of the many holy places, temples, historic sites and festivals he has visited. He has authored almost 50 well-received books on different aspects of Vedic culture and Eastern spirituality and history, along with numerous articles. He has also been involved in the management of various Krishna temples for over 40 years and was the founding president of the Vedic Friends Association in 2001, which he continued for 15 years. Sri Nandanandanaji, a very warm welcome to you. Thank you very much, Anjali, and thank you very much, everybody else. Thank you for tuning in for anybody who has, and uh, we're just going to get into understanding the uh, how the Bhagavad Gita can change your life and all the different ways that it can be utilized or applied in daily life. So for one thing, uh, what we need to do is, uh, of course, you know, most everyone at some point has heard about the Bhagavad Gita, but they do not always know what it really contains or how profound and deep the knowledge that it is in the Bhagavad Gita. So one thing I'm going to do is I'm going to be reading a few portions from my book, uh, The Power of the Bhagavad Gita, which is available, which is a small book, so anybody can read this. It's only like $9.95, and it only takes a few hours to go through and read, and so I'm going to be taking a few portions of that to present tonight. And... Uh, and it's available on Amazon on both paperback and Kindle editions. So like I said, it's easy to read. And that's one of the things I always try to do in my books is make them easy to comprehend, easy to go through, no big words, no a lot of, you know, Sanskrit, all that. So anybody can understand it. But uh, the importance of Bhagavad Gita is not always clearly understood. So that's one of the th reasons I wanted to go through and uh, write this primer, you might say, which can, holds a number and quite a few verses from the Bhagavad Gita and its explanations. But besides being the classic Eastern text that it is, and the summary of most of the important Upanishadic information, it is the core of the deepest levels of spiritual knowledge. It is also like a handbook for life. Just as when you purchase a, uh, an appliance or some kind like a refrigerator, a television or a computer, you get a manual that teaches you how to use it. So in the same way, if God created this world and put, it, put us here for some reason, doesn't it seem like he should also tell us what is the purpose of this life and how to use it accordingly for the best purpose possible? Or what more is more important, I don't know about you, but for me, ever since I was seven years old, I was wondering how I got here. I've never been very comfortable in this world, quite honestly. So one of my main ambitions was if I got in here, how the heck do I get out of here? So the Bhagavad Gita is such an instruction manual for anyone. It provides the basic answers to the most, uh, that most people inquire about uh, life itself and the universal spiritual truths that can be used by anyone, anywhere, and at any time in history. So in this way, it is a timeless piece of literature with timeless wisdom. The purpose of the Bhagavad Gita is for universal well-being on every level. It may have been spoken to Arjuna to alleviate his delusion about things, but it is meant for everyone. And that is why it is so important to study, understand it, and to apply its principles that continue to be relevant 
to many situations in modern day existence. In this way, it is also non-sectarian. It can be applied by anyone from any background, any culture, any religion for the benefits that it has to offer. So even in India, every spiritual leader or acharya from the different lineages have all taken benefit from the Bhagavad Gita. In fact, in order to make themselves more authorized, oftentimes they also write their own commentary on the Bhagavad Gita. So not only does it offer spiritual knowledge, but many scientists have also found scientific insights from it. Thus, it is for the common people as well as scholars. The Bhagavad Gita emphasizes harmonious growth and development for everyone at all levels of life. So let me explain a little of its importance and why we should take it seriously. Of course, we know it was spoken on the battlefield at Kuruksetra as the forces prepared for war, a war meant to uphold the dharmic principles against those who were bereft of them and before things became more evil than they already were. And for those that are interested, you can visit this battlefield of Kuruksetra, just three hours north of Delhi. So in the battle, there was little time in which to speak the Bhagavad Gita. Therefore, it was a brief conversation and just a chapter in the huge uh, uh, composition of Mahabharata. And uh, that conversation was between Arjuna and Lord Sri Krishna. So once the scene is set in the first chapter, from the second chapter, it begins to explain some of the highest spiritual realizations known to humanity. It begins to explain exactly who and what we really are as spiritual beings. So without this knowledge in a person's life, the Vedic literature says that humans are basically little better than polished animals. And that may sound like a rude statement or a consideration, but the reason for this conclusion is that human life is especially meant for spiritual inquiry, because in no other species of life here on earth does the living being have the faculty, such as the intelligence and the means to understand spiritual knowledge. Otherwise, this implies that there is little difference in the purpose of life between humans and animals who are mostly interested in merely eating, sleeping, mating, and defending what they think is theirs. So, however, human life is not merely the means to acquire knowledge from the teachings and explanations of others, but it also offers the facility to realize it within oneself by practice. And by practice, we mean sadhana, which is spiritual practice. It is a matter of uplifting one's consciousness so that one can perceive the higher dimensions that exist all around us. This is more than merely accepting something on faith alone. It is not a faith-based religion. You may start with faith, but the point of it is, it is meant to give you your own spiritual experiences. So it is a matter of attaining direct perception of what the Vedic literature discusses. So from the second chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, we begin to learn our real identity as the soul within these bodies. The Bhagavad Gita explains the size and nature of the soul. And that was one thing that really uh, attracted me to Bhagavad Gita because no other place did I ever learn when I was studying all the different religions of the world, no other place did I ever learn this kind of information. So, it is beyond time and beyond the effects of the three-dimensional world in this spiritual identity that we should be able to realize and understand. It is beyond the limitations of the body and mind. So we in, itself, in ourselves, in our true identity, are beyond this material situation altogether. This teaches us many things. If we can understand this and begin to realize that we're not the body, but we're situated in the body. It shows that regardless of our physical limitations, we can rise above them because spiritually, we are already above them. We just need to realize that. We simply have to realize that what, what does it mean, however, to realize it? So it means to directly perceive the truth and to see it as plain as day, just as we see, I see this hand in front of me. That means that we begin to see our spiritual identity just as clearly. And to do that, we just need to 
clear our consciousness of all the mud that gets in the way of our vision. <laughs> and then once we begin to see that, then we live according to that realization. We, get, we live according to reality, that we're not this body, we're not, this is not our home. We begin to think that this is our family, this is my wife, this is my children, on and on and on. But ultimately, we have to leave all those things at the time of death anyway. So then what is real? What is it? So this teaches us that regardless of our situation, socially or physically or economically, we can rise to higher levels of existence, both in this world and in the next. This teaches us that no matter what kind of pressures we may feel from our classmates at school, or what good or bad biases they may come, uh, that may come from our fellow workers, or what kind of labels they put on us, or how much they may purposefully demean or criticize us, or even how great we think we are, or how, we, how grounded we may be, fixed in understanding who and what we really are as spiritual beings inside the limited body is the foundation of real knowledge. And that's also the foundation of understanding exactly who and what we are, regardless of what anybody else may act or consider us to be. That is how we should see ourselves. And then we can become confident that regardless of what others may say, we know who we are and can go through life fixed in perceiving our real identity and our purpose in this life and what really is our highest potential. As an old saying points out, it is better to see yourself truly than to care how others see you. So when you are spiritually grounded like this, which is uh, possible just from the information in the first or the second chapter, I mean to say, of the Bhagavad Gita, it is no longer necessary to always try to convince others of your self-worth or of your social status or of trying to make it into the right click or make yourself acceptable to the right group of people. We become convinced of who we are. And this is what's the importance. And we work in our own way to provide a contribution to society and to make something of ourselves that has meaning beyond the typical superficialities and meaninglessness and worldly gossip that occupy the minds of most youth and adults today. We know that as long as we keep working in our own way, both intellectually and spiritually, attaining the skills that will enable us to do something significant, that our time will come when we can make a mark on this world in our own sphere of influence, which may continue to expand from there, and to help others also attain a higher level of spiritual understanding is practically the best social work that anybody can do. And like the saying goes, charity starts at home, so we start with our own sphere of influence. So we may be popular in school or not, or recognized in our career or not, but by our spiritual knowledge as provided in the Bhagavad Gita, and by the confidence it gives us, we work to always become better, more uplifted, more refined, and more realized than we are at present, always making ourselves into a better person. Then we can help ourselves and others in more effective ways. This is just some of what the second chapter of the Bhagavad Gita can provide if we look into it carefully and understand who we really are and what is our greatest potential. So this is just from one aspect of uh, understanding the Bhagavad Gita from the second chapter, but there's so many other different areas of knowledge that it has to offer. And I'll just, uh, now when I go through, this is uh, the second chapter of uh, the power of Bhagavad Gita, but uh, how we can apply different aspects of Bhagavad Gita to our daily life. I'm not going to go through and explain all of these. I'm just going to go through the topics. Uh, but for those that are interested, each one of these topics I elaborate on more completely in the book itself. For example, some of the things that it offers is the principles for good management. Now, it's interesting because some of the devotees that I know 
have written whole books on this point alone, on the principles of good management as provided by Bhagavad Gita. In fact, one time when I was doing a lecture tour in India, I was in Bangalore at the International Institute of uh, Management, which is a big college. And uh, I was able to talk to spend some time with the dean of the college. And he had also written a book on the principles of management as found in Bhagavad Gita and was also offering a class as part of the curriculum in the college that students could take based on this topic alone, which is the principles of management uh, as found in Bhagavad Gita. So this was, uh, I thought this was very interesting. But I, so I dwelt, dwell on this uh, for, for several pages in this book, Power of Bhagavad Gita. But uh, as one of the things that one can get out of the Bhagavad Gita to apply in this day and age right now, right here. And uh, another point is the Bhagavad Gita and the principles of good leadership. It also outlines from Lord Krishna the principles of what a good leader is bound to have in order to be effective in his leadership and the way in dealing with others, uh, whether from a uh, social point of view, whether from a, a, you might say, an employment point of view or whatever. So this is another aspect of that. Another thing that the Bhagavad Gita offers is work ethics in, as found in the Bhagavad Gita. So uh, how do we look towards being, say, like an employee? Or what is our work ethics? What standards should we keep? How seriously should we take our uh, profession and our career, things like that. So this is also explained in the Bhagavad Gita. So uh, another point which many people like to deal with is uh, how to deal with stress, how to overcome stressful situations. And that also uh, Lord Krishna explains very clearly how to deal with stress so that we can overcome it or maybe just uh, let stressful situations roll off our back like uh, water off of a duck's back, as they say. So these are things that uh, we can use right now, right here. Uh, doesn't have to, we don't have to wait for spiritual development, but we can use it in our everyday life. Uh, another thing that comes up, and I, when I do my lecture tours of India, I'm surprised at how many people come up and ask me, how can I control my mind? My mind just takes me all over the place. And indeed, uh, Krishna explains how to control the mind. Because in the Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna explains or questions Krishna and says that the mind is like the wind. You know, it just goes wherever it wants to go, anywhere it wants to go. How are we supposed to control this? So in uh, Bhagavad Gita, Krishna explains how to control the mind. And the next step is how to attain peace of mind. So if you can't control the mind, at least you can stifle it in a way where it can be, at least you can still have peace of mind. Everybody wants to have peace of mind because with Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, again, without peace of mind, what question is there for having any happiness? So you have to have peace of mind in order to have happiness. Uh, that's a basic thing. Another thing that's covered is heightening self-confidence and self-esteem, which we went over briefly just a few minutes ago from the information we get from the second chapter, how we can have our own self-confidence in understanding who we are and how to apply ourselves in this material world. So uh, another point is dealing with sorrow and death. As the saying goes, there's one sure thing is taxes and death. So, but how do we deal with it? How do we deal with death? How do we deal with the sorrow that often accompanies death? How are we supposed to have the vision that uh, allows us to overcome these circumstances? Plus, how do we prepare for our own death? This is another thing that Bhagavad Gita and Lord Krishna explains, uh, how we can handle these kind of situations. And the next point is attaining fearlessness. How do we go through life being unafraid of whatever challenges may come? Of course, they always say, as explained in other Vedic literature, 
that fear is nothing more than the fear of death, the fear of the future, the fear of the unknown. Every other fear is simply a reflection of that. So Krishna explains in Bhagavad Gita the different means by which we can overcome that fearfulness. Another point is the key to proper foods for health and consciousness. Now, Krishna introduces this idea in the Bhagavad Gita, and it's, of course, it's carried more fully uh, through the Ayur, principles of Ayurveda. Uh, but Krishna begins to explain how, what kind of foods to eat for health and for uplifting our consciousness and uh, our further development in this way. Because, you know, food plays an integral part in our existence of keeping body and soul together. Next point is Bhagavad Gita as a psychological guide. Now, this is interesting because the last few uh, tours I've done through India, I've come across people that have put more and more emphasis on how the Vedic literature can also be used for developing as a, or used as a psychological guide or the, what they call Vedic psychology. So I go into this a little bit in this book, how it can be used for such a purpose. Then, of course, acquiring proper knowledge. Of course, we have to acquire proper knowledge, but in order to acquire it, you have to first know what it is. And Krishna explains all the different topics that he considers to be proper knowledge. Even the Upanishads say that one of the first duties in life is to find somebody who can actually explain spiritual truth to you. So you have to know what is spiritual truth, how to find someone who actually knows that truth, and then how to be able to listen to understand that truth and acquire the proper knowledge by which you can use for uh, handling life and directing your life in the proper direction. Another point is meditation, according to Bhagavad Gita. Meditation is becoming more and more important, more and more popular. And some of the original ways of learning how to do meditation is explained by Lord Krishna in Bhagavad Gita. And then, of course, it goes into the supreme yoga. There are different forms of yoga. And Krishna explains these different forms of yoga, but he also explains what he considers to be the supreme form of yoga, the most effective ways of engaging in yoga, especially in this day and age. And then he also explains options for those who cannot follow the spiritual path. So it's not like a uh, dictatorial thesis that uh, it's my way or the highway, but for those people who cannot always follow the highest standards, uh, as he explains in Bhagavad Gita, he also gives other options by which you can also participate and follow and still continue to develop yourself spiritually. So this is very liberal in that sense. Then there's also a section on Bhagavad Gita as a key to spiritual enlightenment. This is uh, one of the prominent factors uh, that uh, we feel uh, may be overlooked. It's a key to spiritual enlightenment, how you become spiritual enlightened so that you see your spiritual identity and how that identity is connected to the Supreme Person, Lord Sri Krishna himself. So this is also explained in that way. And then I just have one more uh, segment, one more point, as Bhagavad Gita and establishing world peace. So everybody wants to have world peace. Everybody's talking about how to get along with this person, or one country is threatening another country. If they don't do this, they're going to, you know, there's going to be a big reaction or whatever. But uh, still, Krishna explains in Bhagavad Gita how, by utilizing certain knowledge, certain processes of realization, certain processes of uplifting our consciousness, we can easily also understand how to attain world global peace for everybody. So this is uh, some of the topics which I have found to be very interesting in, in the Bhagavad Gita. And uh, in the third chapter of this book, I also have a chapter called 31 Days to Liberation on the Vedic Path. And I utilize a few verses for each day. 
so that each day, if you meditate on these verses and acquire the qualities that these verses in Bhagavad Gita explain, by the end of 31 days, you'll have the qualities uh, and insight and realizations you need to guarantee yourself liberation from any further existence after this life, uh, from further rounds of birth and death in this material world. And the interesting thing, how I got this idea to do that, was when I was in Assam, there was a big uh, campaign <clears throat> amongst different religions up there to try to convert everybody else into their religion. And there was one booklet that I found that said, 31 days to salvation on the Christian path. And I'm going like, we could do this. I could write something like that. So that's how I formulated this particular uh, chapter of the book, 31 Days to Liberation, because we don't believe necessarily in salvation unless we're saved by the knowledge that our guru gives us. And our guru comes into our life by the blessings of Lord Krishna himself. So by the blessings of Lord Krishna, by the blessings of guru, uh, you can say we're saved from uh, the ignorance that will keep us bound up in this material world. But uh, otherwise, uh, liberation is, a, is something that is achieved by our own, uh, what should I say, our own uh, work and dedication, our own sadhana dedication to the teachings of our guru, dedication to the teachings of Lord Krishna is found in Bhagavad Gita. And with that, using those blessings, we can attain liberation in this material world. So, for example, day one starts beginning your new life, day two, why be absorbed in God, and on and on till day 30, being delivered at the time of death, because all, all this is explained in the Bhagavad Gita. And day 31, sharing the message itself, because that itself is a form of uh, bhakti yoga. And the more you explain it to others, the more thoroughly you are understanding the message itself. And I'll get into that, to that in a few minutes, too. Uh, but so anyway, when I put this together, I, th I was wondering, well, how many verses did I use? And I counted all the different verses, day one, day two, day three, day four. I used exactly 108 verses from the Bhagavad Gita to put this chapter together. So in that regard, uh, I feel that uh, this also includes the 108 most important verses from the Bhagavad Gita. And uh, as you can expect, I also used the uh, Bhagavad Gita and the verses from my spiritual master's book, which is Bhagavad Gita as it is by A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. So those, uh, which is accepted to be one of the most scholarly editions of the Bhagavad Gita available. And so I used that book to put uh, this particular chapter together. But also, <clears throat> there's another point that I wanted to present. <clears throat> And that is the Bhagavad Gita's ultimate purpose. We have about a half an hour left, so I think I can get this in uh, for the most part. <clears throat> but there's a recurring theme within the teachings of Bhagavad Gita. And this recurring theme is what the ultimate purpose of Bhagavad Gita is, which out of all these different things I've read so far can be applied in everyday life. So we can see how Bhagavad Gita can change our life right here, right now. But the ultimate purpose is far different than any of those things. For example, uh, the Bhagavad Gita is the essence of all Vedic philosophy and is composed of 700 verses and explains such topics as the nature of the soul, the nature of God, the material of the universe, the nature of activities and karma, uh, the process of reincarnation, process of yoga, the purpose of life, and on. But within the Bhagavad Gita, we can find the teachings for such additional topics as how to have a peaceful life, how to gain stability of mind, and so on. However, out of all of the teachings we find within the Bhagavad Gita, Bhagavan Sri Krishna continues to emphasize the need to end our karma, to stop the cycle of birth and death in this material existence, and to ultimately reach the spiritual world, his abode, where we belong. So all these different topics we can apply, and it'll definitely improve our lives. But the point of it is, 
is when we're in an ocean where the waves are keep waving up and down and we're struggling to survive, we're struggling to stay alive, sometimes the best thing to do is simply get out of the ocean, get free of it altogether. And so, like I said, for a long time, quite honestly, ever since I was seven years old, I was asking myself, how did I get here? How did I get into this body? Why is the body so vulnerable? For example, if you can't breathe for three minutes, you die. But then you have to feed it. You have to let it sleep. You have to take it to the bathroom, all these different things. Why? Is this natural? Is this normal? I could, I could never get used to it, quite honestly. I never have. And uh, so, so what is the purpose of this? And ultimately, if I got into this situation, how can I get out? So that's been one of my questions for a long time, not just how I got here, where I come from, and looking at it from a philosophical point of view, but I'm looking at it from a practical point of view. How can I utilize and find the knowledge which will give me the, the a means and the facility to get out of here once and for all? And go back to wherever I came from. So these, uh, so this is what the Bhagavad Gita often, uh, or we forget. We often forget what the Bhagavad Gita has to offer in this regard. So the verses here form what can be called the foundation of the Bhakti movement in emphasizing devotion to Krishna as the supreme being, which also provides the means to free ourselves from samsara, or the repeated process of birth and death in this material creation, and attain the highest spiritual destination. This would also place attention on Kuruksetra, the Dharma Dham, or Dharmaksetra, since this is the place where Lord Krishna taught this most crucial of information, as found in the Bhagavad Gita. Therefore, the land of Kuruksetra should be considered one of the most important places for not only the bhakti movement, but also as the historical place of, of, of origination for these most essential teachings on Vedic Dharma and where these teachings are most effectively put into action with the battle of Kuruksetra as the background. What follows are a number of verses which explain this most essential reoccurring theme as emphasized by Lord Sri Krishna himself. Starting in chapter two, content of the Gita summarized, after Bhagavan Sri Krishna begins to teach the essential aspects of understanding the soul, he says in verse 72, the real purpose of this knowledge, which is how to follow this path to lead a life that will bring a person to the highest destination possible. And he quotes, that is the way of the spiritual and godly life, after attaining which a man is not bewildered, being so situated, even at the hour of death, one can enter into the kingdom of God, end quote. This is the beginning of recognizing that Lord Krishna wants Arjuna, and all of this, quite honestly, to ultimately attain the spiritual realm. This is the real purpose of his teachings in the Bhagavad Gita. So no matter what else we accomplish, whether it's beautiful wife, beautiful home, uh, you know, big position in a company, um, big bank account. Everybody wants a big bank account. All of this stuff is temporary, and we can't take it with us when we leave this body. But what we can take with us is whatever spiritual progress we've made. That is connected with the soul, and therefore it goes on from one life to another. And this ultimately helps us reach that highest destination of what Krishna is talking about. And then in chapter four, Sri Krishna continues to clarify this in the explanations of what is transcendental knowledge and how to begin to comprehend Krishna as the ultimate absolute truth. He says in verse nine, one who knows the transcendental nature of my appearance and activities does not, upon leaving the body, take his birth again in this material world, but attains my eternal abode or Arjuna. So in this way, understanding the truth and characteristics of Bhagavan Sri Krishna is one method that can bring a person to the spiritual world. But attaining the spiritual world is the main point. It's the main purpose of Bhagavad Gita. Fact is, it's the main purpose of the whole Vedic process. Whatever portion of Vedic literature you study, the ultimate purpose is to rise above material 
bodily attractions and attachments so that we can become free once and for all of uh, needing to continue the rounds of birth and death, being subjected to our karma and be able to enter back into or, or to enter into the spiritual dimension, into the spiritual world. So then in verses 23 and 24 of the same chapter, Lord Krishna again emphasizes that, and I quote, the work of a man who is unattached to the modes of material nature and who is fully situated in transcendental knowledge merges entirely into transcendence or the spiritual domain. A person who is fully absorbed in Krishna consciousness or awareness of the absolute truth is sure to attain the spiritual kingdom because of his full contribution to spiritual activities in which the consummation is absolute and that which is offered is of the same spiritual nature. So in other words, what does that mean? In other words, it means by engaging bhakti yoga or the devotional service to the Supreme Lord, Sri Krishna, such activities are on the spiritual platform, cutting one off from material activities and their reactions or karma and spiritualizes one's consciousness, being absorbed in the absolute in that way, which is the goal for that is the process per, for perceiving and then entering into the spiritual abode. So this is all part of the means by which we can begin to enter into the spiritual world right here, right now. The point I often use is that, you know, like, we already said that there's so many different dimensions all around us. We just can't see them. We're not psychic enough or something. But it's like radio waves. Radio waves are all around us. We can't hear them. We can't touch them. We can't taste them. We can't feel them. But with a good receiver, there's so many radio waves, so many cell phone waves, so many television waves that are all around us that there's so many different ways of utilizing them. You just need the proper receiver. The same thing goes by, by spiritualizing our consciousness, which is basically what Krishna was talking about here, by spiritualizing our consciousness, raising our consciousness, developing and meditating on the spirituality of Lord Krishna and the spiritual dimension. By, we begin to form a receiver in our own consciousness by which the spiritual dimension begins to open up and we begin to see it all around us. And then we begin to act on that level, being a spiritual being within a material body, or as they often say, we're not humans having a spiritual experience, but we're souls having a human experience. But we do want to flip that around. We want to have, we want to be spirit souls having a spiritual experience, even while enveloped in a material body. So this is what the great sages, the realized souls, the pure devotees, that's how they exist. They are spiritual beings having a spiritual experience, even though they're enveloped in this material body and um, in this material creation. They've already, practically speaking, they've already entered the spiritual domain, even though they're simply, they're, they're still here, simply engaged in what appears to be material activities. But the activities dedicated to the Supreme make those same activities spiritual. And that is what spiritualizes our consciousness and spiritualizes our whole existence. So then, in verse 30 of the same chapter, Lord Krishna makes it even more clear by explaining that when a person attains an attraction to performing loving devotional activities to him, that attraction overcomes any material desires and takes one to the spiritual realm. In other words, the attraction, the love that one develops for the supreme lover or a god uh, gives us a taste so high, so ecstatic, that it overcomes whatever other pleasure we might be able to have uh, by engaging in different activities in this material world. So as Krishna says, quote, all these performers who know the meaning of sacrifice become cleansed of sinful reaction meaning freedom from karma, and having tasted the nectar of the remnants of such sacrifice, meaning to attain the attraction to performing spiritual activities, they go to the supreme eternal abode, end quote. Then in verse 32, we find 
that he elaborates by saying, quote, all these different types of sacrifice are approved by the Vedas. And sacrifice doesn't mean that you're, uh, it, well, basically it means like a ritual. It means spiritual practice. And because it is like sacrificing material pleasure for spiritual pleasure. And sometimes, as Bhagavad Gita also says, what is like poison in the beginning and giving up material activities for spiritual pursuits can be uh, somewhat uh, difficult at first until you get a taste for it. Then it says, he says like, what it become, what's like poison in the beginning becomes like nectar in the end. So once you get a taste for these spiritual loving activities based on invoking your love for the supreme lover, then it overcomes all other kinds of tastes that we may have for material uh, attractions. So then in, uh, he says um, in chapter five, when Krishna explains the process of karma yoga or action in Krishna consciousness, verses 24 through 26, he explains one whose happiness is within, who is active within, in other words, on the spiritual dimension, who rejoices within and is illumined within, is actually the perfect mystic. He is liberated in the supreme and ultimately attains the supreme. One who is beyond duality and doubt, whose mind is engaged within, who is always busy working for the welfare of all sentient beings, and who is free from all sins, achieves liberation in the Supreme. Those who are free from anger and all material desires, who are self-realized, self-disciplined, and constantly endeavoring for perfection, are assured of liberation in the Supreme in the very near future. End quote. So here again, Krishna is explaining this is the ultimate goal of human existence in whatever way, whatever manner, whatever shape you can take up the practice. So he's giving like so many different avenues of participating in this practice. And each of these verses mention that. So here again, the purpose of focusing all of our actions on the transcendental nature of who we are and the means to free ourselves from all karma is to ultimately attain liberation or freedom from the continuation of any more material existence. Then in chapter seven, knowledge of the absolute, Bhagavan Sri Krishna explains his different energies and to which energy the individual soul belongs. However, in verse 18, Lord Krishna emphasizes the central purpose of being his devotee and how to most favorably reach the supreme goal. He quotes, all these devotees are undoubtedly magnanimous souls, but he who is situated in knowledge of me, I consider verily to dwell in me, and being engaged in my transcendental service, he attains me. End quote. So here it is. Krishna is explaining how everybody, no matter who they are, can ultimately reach Lord Krishna and his supreme spiritual abode. To elaborate further in chapter 8, Attaining the Supreme, verses 5 through 8, Lord Krishna clearly expresses the purpose of meditation and the ultimate goal for which we should practice through all of the phases of our life. Quote, and whoever at the time of death quits his body, remembering me alone, at once attains my nature. Of this, there is no doubt. Whatever state of being one remembers when he quits his body, that state he will attain without fail. Therefore, Arjuna, you should always think of me in the form of Krishna and at the same time carry out your prescribed duty of fighting. In other words, you still have to carry on your uh, duties of keeping the body and soul together. But with your activities dedicated to me and your mind and intelligence fixed on me, you will attain me without a doubt. He who meditates on the Supreme Personality in this way his mind constantly engaged in remembering me, undeviated from the path, he, O Partha, Arjuna, is sure to reach me. Unquote. So again, Lord Krishna further explains in chapter 8, verses 13 through 14, the ultimate way to prepare for leaving this body so we can attain the highest destination after this life is, and he quotes here, after being situated in this yoga practice and vibrating the sacred syllable Om, 
The supreme combination of letters, if one thinks of the supreme personality of Godhead and quits his body, he will certainly reach the spiritual planets. For one who remembers me without deviation, I am easy to, to obtain. So because of his constant engagement in devotional service or bhakti yoga, and if one can't chant Om, then one can certainly chant the Hare Krishna mantra. So Lord Krishna makes the ultimate purpose of all of his instructions in the Bhagavad Gita very clear by again in chapter 8, verse 21, explaining that he expects us to ultimately attain his spiritual abode. Quote, that supreme abode is called unmanifested and infallible. Unmanifested because it's not easily perceivable here from this material universe. And it is the supreme destination. When one goes there, guess what? He never comes back because that is my supreme abode. So we can go through a number of other verses like this where Krishna explains all these points that I'll go through here to the end. Or finally, after explaining the whole Bhagavad Gita to Arjuna, Lord Krishna reaches the culmination of all such Upanishadic knowledge by summarizing the ultimate goal of any devotee, any sadhu, any God-conscious person. When he says in chapter 18, which is the conclusion or the perfection of renunciation, verses 55 through 56, one can understand the Supreme Personality as he is only by devotional service or bhakti yoga. And when one is fully consciousness of the Supreme Lord by such devotion, he can enter into the kingdom of God. Though engaged in all kinds of activities, my devotee, under my protection, reaches the eternal and imperishable abode by my grace, end quote. And that is the whole point of bhakti yoga. Everybody wants to go to the kingdom of God, but not many want to go because of God or to be with God. They want the, the opulence, the adventure. They want everything that goes with it. But the point of it is, how can you, for example, how can you see the president of the United States if the president of the United States doesn't want to see you? It becomes impossible. But if he sees you, then no one can block your way. So in the same way, if you want to enter the kingdom of God, it is through the means of bhakti yoga or attaining love for God, which attracts God to you. So once God becomes attracted by your devotion, in whatever way you can develop it, then God begins to give you the protection you need by which you can enter into his own kingdom and then engage in ever-loving, ever-blissful, eternal loving activities. Therefore, the ultimate position of any transcendentalist or yogi is to attain the grace of the Lord if we want to enter the spiritual world or kingdom of God. And to do this most effectively, Lord Krishna clearly says again in chapter 18, verses 65 through 66, quote, always think of me, and become my devotee. Worship me and offer your homage unto me. Thus you will come to me without fail. I promise you this because you are my very dear friend. Abandon all varieties of religion. Just surrender unto me, and I shall deliver you from all sinful reaction. Do not fear. End quote. So this is basically Krishna's promise to us. If we become his devotee, if we worship him, if we try to engage in meditation on him, if we simply surrender unto him, then he will take over from there. He will bring us back to his eternal abode uh, so that we can reach our uh, real home and our real destination. So herein is the final conclusion of the purpose of all spiritual activities, without which we have still not quite attained or understood the goal. And for those who help illuminate this, Lord Krishna says in chapter 18, verses 68 through 69, that such a person can certainly attain the goal of the teachings of Bhagavad Gita, quote, for one who explains the supreme secret to the devotees, devotional service is guaranteed, 
and at the end he will come back to me. There is no servant in this world more dear to me than he, nor will there ever be one more dear, end quote. So in other words, teaching this knowledge is itself devotional service or bhakti yoga, which is the basis for spiritualizing our consciousness, and which is the method for entering the spiritual abode of Lord Krishna. This is, practically speaking, Lord Krishna's main duty in coming to the material world, is simply to attract us to him and explain the purpose of life and how to reach the supreme destination. He doesn't want to see us going through this uh, world lifetime after lifetime, continuing to uh, struggle for our existence. It becomes a drag after a while. How many times can you knock your head against the wall because it feels so good when you stop? It's like going to work every day. After a while, you know, repetition uh, becomes a drag no matter what you do. After a while, you do it long enough, you hear a song, the same song often enough, pretty soon it's like, okay, okay, enough, enough is already, you know, let's go on to something else. So it's the same thing. The supreme something else means entering back into the spiritual world. And this is the whole purpose of what Krishna is teaching in Bhagavad Gita. Out of all the other things he presents, this is the ultimate message. So in addition to this, simply by studying the Bhagavad Gita, we lead to, will lead to great achievements on our path of spiritual progress. As Lord Krishna explains in chapters 18, verses 70 and 71, and I declare that he who simply studies the sacred conversation between him and Arjuna worships me by his intelligence, and one who listens with faith and without envy becomes free from sinful reaction and at the very least attains to the planets where the pious dwell, end quote. So can't get more easy than that. Just by studying the Bhagavad Gita, we at least are able to attain the higher planets where we can continue our progress, continue our advancement and development in the higher levels of uh, this universe. But to conclude, all of these verses quoted above and many others that we have uh, presented in this presentation today from Bhagavad Gita indicates that the ultimate purpose of his teachings and quite honestly, the ultimate purpose behind all Vedic knowledge that we are not really a product of this material creation, nor is it our real home, nor will we ever be able to stay here forever. So Lord Krishna emphasizes the real goal of life within this recurring theme, as we've presented from Bhagavad Gita, which is to reach freedom, the ultimate freedom from any further existence in this material world, and attain Bhagavan Sri Krishna's supreme spiritual abode. That is our ultimate destination where we can attain the real nature of the soul, which reveals our true identity, and where we can finally be truly happy and blissful. So that's my presentation. And for those that uh, are also interested, I have presented uh, another book called the Bhakti Yoga Handbook, which is uh, obviously doing very well on Amazon, which surprises the heck out of me, quite honestly. <laughs> But uh, many people like this book, and uh, uh, it's a guide for beginning the essentials of devotional yoga. And for those that want to get into it further, the philosophical, this is the practical aspect, how you can develop an altar at your home and, you know, carry on to the practice at home and things like that. And this book, Bhakti Yoga, The Easy Path of Devotional Yoga, From the Depths of Illusion to Making Contact with God. This explains the philosophical step-by-step -step process of how to engage in bhakti yoga, what each step will give you, and how you can perceive your progress in that way. The other book I have here, out of 50 books that I've written, <laughs> here's another short book. And this book is uh, called The Power of the Maha Mantra. What is so special about chanting Hare Krishna? And uh, this book is also shocking me by doing as well as it has on Amazon. It's a short book. It's easy to read. It only takes a few hours, but it tells you exactly how and what is the purpose of practicing Om, the beginning mantra, mm. and how uh, we chant Hare Krishna, well, the power of the Hare Krishna mantra, 
and how to make your own set of japa beads and how to practice chanting Hare Krishna on a set of beads or simply sitting down and singing the mantra itself. And uh, I remember uh, uh, there's a program on Amazon where you can become a member and uh, you can download some of these books, these Kindle books for a fraction of the cost. And I remember I couldn't believe it. One month, in one month time, this book was downloaded 1,000 times. Mm. I couldn't believe it. And this book, the book on Bhakti Yoga, the Easy Path of Devotional Yoga, in one month time, doesn't mean they always do this, but in one month time, this was downloaded 750 times. I couldn't believe people were that interested in the power of Bhakti Yoga and the power of the Maha Mantra. So obviously somebody out there is uh, <laughs> interested in uh, this information and how to acquire it to, uh, you know, develop it themselves. And even if it doesn't go, you know, that many times, quite often a month, every month, each book will be downloaded several hundred times, um, you know, 200, 300, things like that, besides being sold through different aspects, uh, whether it's Kindle or paperback. So Anyway, that's my whole purpose in life is to try to make this knowledge available to those of you that want to make spiritual development as easily as possible, as quickly understandable as possible. And uh, I may seem I may seem a little bit forceful at times, but it's only because I'm 70 years old. And it's quite often every three to five days I read about another devotee mm. that's leaving this world and they often leave between the ages of 70 and 80. So time is of the essence. I'm running out of time. So it's important to me to take this knowledge seriously, but it's important to me to try to help others who also want to take this knowledge seriously. And for that, I can only thank my own spiritual master, Srila A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada for making this knowledge available the way he has, and for also giving me the blessings to be able to what I say, simplify it, simplify it in a way that other people can take to it as easily and simply as possible. So anyway, we're running out of time. The end of this uh, little presentation, I hope you've been able to follow it, get something out of it. And uh, so thank you very much. Jai Shri Krishna. Jai. And, uh, <laughs> thank you, everybody that's tuned in. I have one question that's been asked. Do you have a minute to answer it? I've got a minute, okay. <laughs> as, long, as long as you've got a minute. <laughs> uh, we've got a minute. Uh, the question is, I come from a Christian background, yet over the years, I've had several Hindu gods come to me in my dreams. Mm. Krishna came to me in the form of a brass statue, and a few weeks ago, I came across another god. I'm wondering why they would choose me, and how can I get closer to finding which path I should choose? Thank you. Well, like I say, Krishna has given the Bhagavad Gita. One thing you should do before you do anything else is to read and study the Bhagavad Gita and find out what his message really is. Or you can get my book, The Power of, the Ma uh, Power of Bhagavad Gita, to find out in a summary way what his message is and how seriously uh, one should take it, which I tried to present at the end of uh, this presentation, how seriously we should take uh, Krishna's message and what his real message is. Uh, but there was a story one time where one, uh, um, pre the president's temple president's wife had, uh, Krishna come to her in a dream saying, I'm cold, I'm cold. So she woke up the next morning, asked her husband, well, why would Krishna come to me telling me he's cold? Why was he cold? So they went on the altar and they looked around, they found that one of the windows in the back of the altar was broken, and there was a cold draft coming in. <laughs> so they plugged up the draft. But so uh, the, the wife was thinking, well, why would Krishna come to me? And the president's wife was saying, well, why wouldn't Krishna come to you? <laughs> you know, if you're receptive to his teaching, if you're receptive to what he has to say, then why wouldn't he come to you? and let you understand a little more clearly what he's giving you, the advantage of what he's giving you, the power of what he's giving you. And uh, so it's all a matter of how receptive we are. If we're receptive to it, then Krishna will give us his message one way or another, either directly or through a dream 
or through the teachings of the Vedic literature or somehow or another. But the point of it is, uh, as long as you're receptive, then Krishna will make himself more and more available to you. Uh, and if other gods have come to you, if other deities have come to you, like maybe Ganesh or something like that, that is also to help clear the way for you to ultimately understand the ultimate teaching, the ultimate purpose of what the Vedic tradition has to offer. And if you're receptive to it, then you can expect more. <laughs> Simple as that. So anyway, take the time and energy and uh, begin to uh, you know, take this knowledge seriously, because uh, obviously they wouldn't be coming to you if they thought that you wouldn't take it seriously. Absolutely. So I Krishna. <laughs> I hope that answers your question. I hope it answers their question, but yes, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you so much, Srinanda Nandana, Stephen Knapp. <laughs> and uh, I'm very proud of how you presented the philosophy this evening on behalf of our mutual spiritual master, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. I know that he would be proud of you. And we, as members of VFA, are very proud of you being our founding president you helped to start this organization. So we're just trying to carry on with that same spirit. And I like the way you said, simplifying the philosophy. There's an acronym, it's K-I-S-S. -S, and normally that stands for keep it simple, stupid. <laughs> but I changed it to say, keep it simple, sadhus or saintly persons, because we have a tendency to make everything complicated. So what you did tonight was you brought it into focus, you made it understandable, and I'm, I'm sure that the people who were blessed to be on this call had some tools to put in their transcendental toolbox that will help them carry on in their life and find that inner peace that you talked about. So thank you so much. And uh, we look forward to having you back again as many times as you like. And to all of you who attended tonight, we're so honored to have your presence here. You made it special. And if you haven't already signed up for our mailing list, please make sure and do that. The link is in the chat box. And all of you have a wonderful evening. Please, please, please stay safe during these difficult times. And may you all be blessed. Hare Krishna and Namaste. Hare Shri Krishna and Namaste. Oh. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Can I greet Stephen? Yes. So much. So much. Yeah, yeah. What a delight to have uh, heard you. Fantastic lecture. Oh, well, thank to you. Thank you, Balbatu Dasji. Wonderful. Very oh. great lecture. So much, Very yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Nice to see you again, Subash. I often try to follow you on uh, Facebook or uh, linked or whatever to find out what you're up to these days. <laughs> so you're always coming out with new articles and things like that. So uh, I, I greatly appreciate all your contributions. You far exceed me in your intellectual and scientific understanding of things. So <laughs> I'm always like trying to catch up with Subhash, so. <laughs> and I'm trying to catch up with you, with your 50 books. What a great achievement. <laughs> you are so productive. And, and, and you know, you've been, made, you've been able to make it um, easily understandable for the wide world. And this is what we need in these difficult times, especially, you know, with all that's happening around this world, not only in terms of health, but in many other spheres. Yeah. So you are... Mm -hmm. You are the teacher of our times, and we must praise you for that. Well, I don't deserve everything you just said, but thank you very much anyway, Subhash. I greatly appreciate it. I often remember, recall our travels in, uh, in uh, India together. So yeah, that was, across uh, India, yes, yes. Many years ago, great. almost 20 years ago, all across the country. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, that was great. So, well, thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Have a good stay. evening. And Jai. the members of VFA can stay on for a few minutes. Take care, everybody. Jai. Hare Krishna. Jai.